Hello again, I am Blunty and this is the new Apple TV, refreshed from the ground up. New CPU, new operating system, new, well, new-ish user interface. Uh, and at long last, an actual app store, which is the first time an Apple TV has had that, which means, thankfully, you're no longer trapped within the very limited amount of applications and streaming options that uh, Apple have deemed fit to give you so far with the Apple TV line now. The doors are opened. Now you can kind of do what you want within limits. It is Apple after all. And the long and the short of it is this. It's quite a promising experience. Using it in general has been really nice, but in some very un-Apple ways, some stuff is just clumsy and, and, and broken and just flat out stupid. But first things first, the setup is a wonderful example of the type of cleverness Apple can get up to if you live within their ecosystem. So when I plugged this in, I didn't have to punch in my Wi-Fi details, my Apple ID login, and, and all of that other kind of stuff. All I had to do was hold up my iPhone to it. Boop. And it connected to it via Bluetooth, and it squirted across all the vital information, except for the password, of course, which you had to enter in manually, because that's a security issue thing there. But it was just just blissfully easy to get this thing up and running. It was literally just do that and type in the password on the phone. Okay, here's my Apple ID password. Doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop, and done. Everything was set up. I was logged in properly. It was brilliant, you know. It was connecting to my Wi-Fi network. I didn't even have to do anything. It just... It just worked. Um, however, here is where the issues start cropping up. So, you know, remember where I told you I could punch in my uh, punch in my password on my phone here to get it up and running? Well, that's the one and only time where you can actually use your iPhone to actually enter text in the system. Everything else from then on in past the setup is, is done via the remote and an on-screen keyboard, except it isn't really an on-screen keyboard. It's a line of text that goes across the top of the screen. You have to scroll through the entire alphabet one letter at a time instead of moving sort of a little more efficiently across and down a keyboard and stuff like that. And it's just, well, it's miserable. It's crap. And I suppose you're thinking to yourself, well, I'll just use the, uh, the Apple remote app that I used to use with the old TV, Apple TV, and I could enter text that way, much like you know, Sony do it that way with their PlayStation 2. They've got an app on their phone, you connect it to your PlayStation, and you don't have to use the control pad for text input anymore. You can do it on your phone. Fast, easy, simple. But no, for some unfathomable reason, the application, the remote Apple TV remote application for the iPhone has not been updated to support the new Apple TV. Whose decision was that? That was idiotic. So... The only option you've got for text input is that. So I'm really, really hoping that there was just some some screw up somewhere that meant they couldn't update the app for this thing in time. You know, they the, the discovered a security hole or something they had to fix before they could put it out there on time. And 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 it was just this, a slightly embarrassing thing that they don't want to talk about. And any day now, the app will be updated so I can just enter text for searches and logins and stuff using my phone instead of the awful, awful, awful on-screen keyboard. Except it's not a keyboard; it's a line of text. <laughs> The remote, by the way, in all other aspects, works really nicely. It does feel a little bit too small for my my enormous man hands here. I've big, got big meaty, meaty man paws, and it does feel kind of small on that, particularly if using it sideways for gaming and stuff. And I'll talk about gaming more in a completely separate video, a little bit more in this video, but a little bit more in a separate video as well. We're going to dig right into it, so don't fret about that. Um, but in general, it's a really nice experience. The buttons are nicely laid out. The Siri button has a little concave in it, so even in the dark, you can sort of, you know, locate yourself on the remote and find all the other necessary buttons. It has a little very basic universal uh, remote functionality built in, so I can teach this how to control the volume on my TV, which is a really nice thing. The battery on it is said to only need a charge from the lightning port a few times a year. Uh, and obviously that isn't something I've had time to properly test and I imagine keeping the Bluetooth on the remote constantly active, like during a gaming session for example, will drain it much faster, but I haven't managed to drain it yet and only time will really tell on this one. It has a dedicated button for the Siri voice commands and two onboard mics, one for you and one to pick up ambient stuff for noise cancellation. Cancellation? Cancellation. <laughs> so it can pick up your voice cleaner. The voice operation is pretty amazing too mostly. 
The Apple TV itself hums away in utter fanless silence, running out on the same CPU as is found in my iPhone 6 Plus S thingy here, but 6S Plus, naming conventions. Um, the operating system on this thing too is a very close relative of the one they use on the phones. It is said to be 95% the same as iOS 9. Um, so that means, amongst other things, that uh, app developers can just push this stuff across the Apple TV without having to do much work at all. Most of the code is going to be the same. The only thing they really have to do is pay attention to the fact that you'll be seeing it from you know, a television's type distance instead of this distance. And of course, adjusting their interfaces to suit the remote instead of a touchscreen, which not all app developers have done. There is right now some very hastily ported stuff that's just been squirted across the Apple TV so they can go, oh, I'm here first, I'm here first, I'm the only option, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here first. But they haven't really paid attention on how their apps work with this thing. And they are catastrophic barely usable foster clucks. However, there are also some app developers out there who have done a really brilliant job of adapting their interfaces to this thing. And on the note of apps and things, the App Store needs a lot of work too. Right now it's... I wouldn't call it finished. I'm not really sure how it made it out... There's another one of these things. I'm not sure how it made it out Apple's doors. I mean, I'm not one of those people who say, oh, without without Steve Jobs, Apple is doomed and they don't have the magic anymore because I don't believe that. But I don't know what happened here. Maybe it was rushed out. It's, it's, it, but it's, it's just not the App Store experience that you're used to on any of the other devices that have App Stores. The thing that needs most work done on it, and fast, is Discovery. The only apps exposed to you are whatever Apple has handpicked to promote or recommend. There's no way to really explore categories, no way to dig down, and there's no way to even just see a simple list of the stuff that's there. It's the curated main page or a clumsy manual search using that awful on-screen key I'm not, I can't call it a keyboard, can I? It's not a keyboard. That awful on-screen line of text. Searching letter by letter. That's literally what I did when I first got this thing, when I discovered that there was no way to dig into the App Store. I just went, okay, show me all the apps that begin with A. Okay, delete the A, enter the B, show me all the apps that start with B. Okay, fine. Scroll across to the delete button that's all the way at the other end of the keyboard, then scroll back to the C, and on and on. I went through the whole alphabet like that. Just, to, just That was the only way I could see the entire range of apps that were sitting there. It was, it was a nightmare. Crap, super, super huge, big, smelly crap sitting on the sidewalk that you just put your foot right in when you're wearing thongs or flip-flops if you're from anywhere else in the world except for Australia. And it's a worrying symptom of Apple perhaps getting lazy or, or, or sloppy or, or just half assed uh, uh, And considering how much emphasis that Apple put on apps when they announced this thing up on stage, they go, oh, you've got apps and it's wonderful. And then look at these people who are making apps for it. That's going to be awesome. And you can do this. But what's the point of having a wonderful range of apps when you can't really discover them properly? And I have to imagine the devs out there are apoplectic at this state of affairs. It's hard enough to get noticed in the app marketplace, which is just catastrophically crowded, mostly with crap. It's really hard for the good developers to get this stuff surfacing, to get noticed even. So being stuck on a system where people just can't browse the app store properly has got to be infuriating for an app developer. But the core interface itself on the App Store is really quite nice. It's like the main interface, you just sort of scroll around it nice and easily and naturally using the little touchpad here. And it's all very pretty, very natural, very clean, very smooth. And in general, it's nice. It's just the functionality that you really need is missing. And when we get back to the, the, the main page, the main menu page, there's more issues. There's no way to properly sort, organize, categorize the apps that you've downloaded. So if you download more than a dozen apps, you'll be, you'll be scrolling down the friggin' list. It's, it's like the earliest days of the iPhone. Remember when there was no folders and stuff on these things? Where if you had a whole bunch of apps, you would just be scrolling across forever on pages and pages and pages of apps. And you had to sort of manually move them about. So you had a page of games maybe and a page of, you know, social media stuff. And But now... For years now, we've had folders. So you go, okay, all my video recording apps, they can go in the video folder. All my you know, photography apps, they can go in that folder. All my editing apps go in that folder. Um, social media stuff across the bottom there. You know, you can organize stuff to make it simple to find the things you need instead of having to go swipe, 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 swipe. Well, there's none of that on the Apple TV. There are no folders, no categories, no nothing. It's just a list of stuff. And you can 
move things throughout the list. Again, like the earliest days on the iPhone, you could move the icons around and, and sort of get a faux organizational structure going. So you can have, well, games at the bottom and, and streaming apps at the top, maybe. But it's, it's, it's immensely frustrating to see. I mean, it's 2015. 2015, and Apple are going, well, it's the app ecosystem. Everyone's using apps to do their things today, so we're going to have apps on this thing. And then they give you no way to actually organize the app so you can actually get to the apps you want to get at in a sensible fashion. Why? Why? Johnny Ive, Johnny Ive, you're responsible for the interface and shit now. What are you doing? Are you drunk? Have you lost your touch? Or is, or, is, or is elegance and simplicity and minimalism more important than actually being able to use the thing? And there is nice things about the interface. It is a very pretty, and clean, and efficient feeling interface. Uh, there's, there's, there's lots of little touches that go through it, little 3D effects and shadowing and scaling and the ability to generally move your thumb around on the pad and kind of make the icons and tiles wobble a bit and sometimes they even have sort of a parallax 3d effect and then the wobble which looks really nice it's completely impractical and useless but it looks really nice nice work johnny it's a really pleasant experience to move about in i mean i wish i could organize stuff so i wouldn't have to move about in it quite so much to get to stuff but in general using interface it is really nice and probably one of the nicest if not the nicest uh, what you call 10 foot interfaces you know interfaces designed for tvs on the other side of the room that i've ever used it is really nice the, the text only appears where you need the text so you're not it doesn't look crowded and, and clustered or anything and it's nice it's dumb dumbed down but it's nice and as i mentioned the the siri voice commands work really nicely too mostly uh you can ask for stuff in a natural way. You don't have to speak really clearly. I can speak to you. I can speak to Siri like I'm speaking to you now. Conversationally, have my, my natural pattern, my natural accent, my, the, the flow of the way I speak. It has worked, except for one example, flawlessly. I can say, Siri, uh, go forward 10 minutes. Siri, go back 10 minutes. Stop and go back to the main menu. Find me this thing. Find me this actor. Find me movies with this person. And, and, it's, it's, you know, everything I've asked it to do works really nicely. You can go, well, see, you know, you're watching a movie in, in like, or a show in the morning and you go, well, I'm going, I need to go out soon. I wonder what the weather is like out there. Siri, what's the weather like? And boop, up on the bottom of the screen, there's the weather thing and you can show more detail. And yes, I could do that on my phone, but, you know, if you're sitting there on the couch just with that, you can say blah, 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 and it happens. And it, it really does work really nicely. Siri, for the last couple of years now, has been really, really good. I use it all the time on my phone. Mostly it's just a set timer. So I've got, hey, Siri, set a timer for 12 minutes or something when I'm cooking or whatever. But I can do it from across the room and it gets nails it every time. And and the same thing is true with the, I mean, you can't do it across the room because you have to hold the button down to do this. But, you know, Siri works and it works really well, except for one example. Now, I'm not going to really dig into the apps specifically here and talk about, you know, how they each do things. In general, they do things like you're used to having them being done on your phone, on other devices, on the computer, and all the stuff. It, it, they all have a, that little Apple TV experience, like they all have those little shib wibbly tiles where you can move them with your thumb and stuff. And in general, the user interface feels pretty consistent and clean. Um, you know, YouTube and Plex and, and, and Netflix and all the other video streaming apps have uh, a somewhat consistent feel to them. So they're all natural to use and they work really well. Everything's nice and fast and clean and stuff streams properly and it looks lovely on the screen. I mean, and I am going to have a fully dedicated video just on the gaming side of things. But in short, it's looking like it will be a nice little micro console. And while the remote is far from an ideal interface for gaming, it actually can be used surprisingly well. By developers who put thought into it, I have a couple of games on there right now that work really good with the remote, like Rayman, for example. They use the remote in a really clever and intuitive and easy way. I mean, I was using the remote without even thinking about it, without even trying to remember, well, do I swipe this way to do this thing? It just, it's really natural and just a brilliant bit of game interface design as far as I'm concerned. There are other games which tries to use the thing as a, as a joystick and you have to swipe to aim and tap to, it just, it's a, it's a ruinous experience. It, it makes the game virtually unplayable. Uh, when I did the video when I sort of unboxed this thing the day I bought this home, I said, well, this is going to, the remote's going to be crap for gaming. It's not crap for gaming. It's not brilliant for gaming, but it's not crap. It's promising. Um, and as more and more game developers sort of play with this, I'm sure it'll get even better and better. But for now, experience varies wildly. Some are brilliant 
and some people have just moved across their game from the iPhone without having to put any real thought into how they're using this as well. There was one game I was playing, an RPG thing, free to play, piece of crap. They have done so little work on moving across to the Apple TV, the on-screen buttons from the iPhone version are still on there. Buttons you cannot possibly press, they're still on the screen for your thumbs. Mm. Lazy, pathetic, shovelware, shitty developers. No. At the end of the day, my week one impressions are of a device that's overpriced for what it delivers on paper, but it's Apple, so that's kind of par for the course. Uh, but using it does feel like a premium experience. The materials used, mainly on the bit you touch, of course, the remote feel wonderful. The touchpad interface works better than I'd anticipated. The 1080p 60 frames per second interface feels liquid smooth. The UI is clean, uncluttered, and easy to navigate. And having the ability to potentially access the gems of the games that sit in the iOS App Store, games I'd not normally bother with because I like gaming on a big screen, not hunched over my phone, is also a big plus for me. My only real issues are ones that could, and hopefully will, be easily and quickly addressed in software updates. For now though, I've got no buyer's remorse. I have been using this thing constantly, literally <laughs> constantly, pretty much every waking hour where I'm sitting around that lair here. I've been using this to, to game on, to stream on, to, to play local content, to you know use, play music, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's been working wonderfully for it. Certainly it's a nicer, cleaner, faster, more elegant, uh, 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 and less clumsy navigational experience than the Xbox One, which is the my media device of choice before uh, I picked this thing up. And of course, it works silently, which is also a nice little plus as well. Except for the you know the Xbox's fan is no longer humming away in my background, getting slowly louder and louder as the thing wears out. The new TV OS and UI functionality is below the standards I would expect from Apple. And I'm not a voice in the dark on this. I'm hearing the same complaints from pretty much everywhere that it's talking about this on Twitter and reviews and, and anyone who's ever mentioned this thing in the last week or so has said pretty much the same thing I've said about the interface. Um, but yeah, no bias remorse. I'm looking forward to this thing improving because uh, it's a bit rough around the edges right now, but it could be, uh, uh, to use an overused metaphor, a diamond in the rough. It really does seem like it has a lot of promise uh, as as my, my main window into streaming media and also a bit of you know, lightweight little uh, mobile style gaming, but, you know, on a decent big screen instead of just playing games like this, which is not an experience that I particularly enjoy. But anyway, I am Blunty. Thanks for watching. I hope this has been sort of informative or useful to you. Uh, I will get back to you with a dedicated review all about the gaming on this thing. Probably two videos on it, actually. I'll do a video all about the gaming as it stands out of the box, and I'll do another review of the actual Still Series gaming remote in which I'll be, I guess, doing re-reviews of, of some of the games uh, and how they operate, you know, real controller versus this and all that sort of stuff. So drop the comments, let me know what kind of stuff you want me to, uh, to test out when it comes to gaming and things. Uh, but meanwhile, thanks for watching. I am Blunty, and I'll catch you next time.